Chapter 9 of Stories of Inventors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, July 2010. Stories of Inventors. The Adventures of Inventors and Engineers by Russell Doubleday. Chapter 9 submarines in war and peace during the early part of the spanish-american war a fleet of vessels patrolled the atlantic coast from florida to maine the spanish admiral cervera had left the home waters with his fleet of cruisers and torpedo boats and no one knew where they were the lookouts on all the vessels were ordered to keep a sharp watch for strange ships and especially for those having a warlike appearance all the newspapers and letters received on board the different cruisers of the patrol fleet told of the anxiety felt in the coast towns and of the fear that the Spanish ships would appear suddenly and begin a bombardment. To add to the excitement and expectation, especially of the green crews, the men were frequently called out of their comfortable hammocks in the middle of the night and sent to their stations at guns and ammunition magazines just as if a battle was imminent all this was for the purpose of familiarizing the crews with the duties under war conditions though no enlisted man knew whether he was called to quarters to fight or for drill these were the conditions then when one bright sunday the crew of an auxiliary cruiser were very busy cleaning ship a very thorough and absorbing business while the men were in the thick of the scrubbing one of the crew stood up to straighten his back and looked out through an open port in the vessel's side as he looked he caught a glimpse of a low black craft hardly five hundred yards off coming straight for the cruiser the water foamed at her bows and the black smoke poured out of her funnels streaking behind her a long sinister cloud it was one of those venomous little torpedo boats and she was apparently rushing in at top speed to get within easy range of the large warship a torpedo boat is headed straight for us cried the man at the port and at the same moment came the call for general quarters as the men ran to their stations the word was passed from one to the other a Spanish torpedo boat is headed for us. With haste born of desperation, the crew worked to get ready for action, and when all was ready, each man in his place, guns loaded, firing lanyards in hand, gun trainers at the wheels, all was still, no command to fire was given. From the signal boys to the firemen in the stokehole, for news travels fast aboard ship, all were expecting the muffled report and the rending, tearing explosion of a torpedo under the ship's bottom. The terrible power of the torpedo was known to all, and the dread that filled the hearts of that waiting crew could not be put into words. Of course, it was a false alarm. The torpedo boat flew the stars and stripes, but the heavy smoke concealed it, and the officers, perceiving the opportunities for testing the men, let it be believed that a boat belonging to the enemy was bearing down on them. The crews of vessels engaged in future wars will have not only swifter, surer torpedo boats to menace them, but even more dreadful foes. The conning towers of the submarines show but a foot or two above the surface, a sinister black spot on the water, like the dorsal fin of a shark, that suggests but does not reveal the cruel power below. For an instant the knob lingers above the surface while the steersman gets his bearings, and then it sinks in a swirling eddy, leaving no mark showing in what direction it has traveled. Then the crew of the exposed warship wait and wonder with a sickening cold fear in their hearts how soon the crash will come, and pray that the deadly submarine torpedo will miss its mark. Submarine torpedo boats are actual, practical working vessels today, and already they have to be considered in the naval plans for attack and defense.
Though the importance of submarines in warfare, and especially as a weapon of defense, is beginning to be thoroughly recognized, it took a long time to arouse the interest of naval men and the public generally sufficient to give the inventors the support they needed. Americans once had within their grasp the means to blow some of their enemy ships out of the water, but they did not realize it, as will be shown in the following, and for a hundred years the progress in this direction was hindered. It was during the American Revolution that a man went below the surface of the waters of New York Harbor in a submarine boat just big enough to hold him, and in the darkness and gloom of the underwater world propelled his turtle-like craft toward the British ships anchored in midstream. On the outside shell of the craft rested a magazine with a heavy charge of gunpowder, which the submarine navigator intended to screw fast to the bottom of a fifty-gun British man-of-war, and which was to be exploded by a time fuse after he had got well out of harm's way. Slowly and with infinite labor, this first submarine navigator worked his way through the water in the first successful underwater boat, the crank handle of the propelling screw in front of him, the helm at his side, and the crank handle of the screw that raised or lowered the craft just above and in front. No other man had made a like voyage. He had little experience to guide him, and he lacked the confidence that a well-tried device assures. He was alone in a tiny vessel with but half an hour's supply of air, a great box of gunpowder over him, and a hostile fleet all around. It was a perilous position, and he felt it. With his head in the little conning tower, he was able to get a glimpse of the ship he was bent on destroying. As from time to time, he raised his little craft to get his bearings. At last, he reached his all-unsuspecting quarry and, sinking under the keel, tried to attach the torpedo. There, in the darkness of the depths of North River, this unnamed hero, in the first practical submarine boat, worked to make the first torpedo fast to the bottom of the enemy ship, but a little iron plate or bolt holding the rudder in place made all the difference between a failure that few people ever heard of and a great achievement that would have made the inventor of the boat, David Bushnell, famous everywhere, and the navigator a great hero. The little iron plate, however, prevented the screw from taking hold, the tide carried the submarine past, and the chance was lost. David Bushnell was too far ahead of his time, his invention was not appreciated, and the failure of his first attempt prevented him from getting the support he needed to demonstrate the usefulness of his underwater craft. The piece of iron in the keel of the British warship probably put back development of submarine boats many years, for Bushnell's boat contained many of the principles upon which the successful underwater craft of the present time are built. One hundred and twenty-five years after the subsurface voyage described above, a steel boat, built like a whale, but with a prow coming to a point, manned by a crew of six, traveling at an average rate of eight knots an hour, armed with five whitehead torpedoes, and designed and built by Americans, passed directly over the spot where the first submarine boat attacked the British fleet. The Holland boat Fulton had already traveled the length of Long Island Sound, diving at intervals before reaching New York, and was on her way to the Delaware Capes. She was the invention of John P. Holland, and the result of twenty-five years of experimenting, nine experimental boats having been built before this persistent and courageous inventor produced a craft that came up to his ideals. The cruise of the Fulton was like a march of triumph, and proved beyond a doubt that the Holland submarines were practical, sea-going craft. At the eastern end of Long Island, the captain and crew, six men in all, 
one by one entered the Fulton through the round hatch in the conning tower that projected about two feet above the back of the fish-like vessel. Each man had his own particular place aboard and definite duties to perform, so there was no need to move about much, nor was there much room left by the gasoline motor, the electric motor, storage batteries, air compressor and air ballast and gasoline tanks, and the whitehead torpedoes. The captain stood up inside of the conning tower with his eyes on a level with the little thick glass windows, and in front of him was the wheel connecting with the rudder that steered the craft right and left. Almost at his feet was stationed the man who controlled the diving rudders. Farther aft was the engineer, all ready for the word to start his motor. Another man controlled the ballast tanks, and another watched the electric motor and batteries. With a clang, the lid-like hatch to the conning tower was closed and clamped fast in its rubber setting. The gasoline engine began its rapid putt-putt, and the submarine boat began its long journey down Long Island Sound. The boat started in with her deck awash, that is, with two or three feet freeboard or of deck above the water line. In this condition, she could travel as long as her supply of gasoline held out, her tanks holding enough to drive her 560 knots at the speed of six knots an hour. When in the semi-awash condition, the lower she sank, the greater the surface exposed to the friction of the water and the greater power expended to attain a given speed. As the vessel jogged along, with a good part of her deck showing above the waters, her air ventilators were open, and the burnt gas of the engine was exhausted right out into the open. The air was as pure as in the cabin of an ordinary ship. Besides the work of propelling the boat, the engine being geared to the electric motor made it revolve, so turning it into a dynamo that created electricity and filled up the storage batteries. From time to time, as this whale-like ship plowed the waters of the sound, a big wave would flow entirely over her, and the captain would be looking right into the foaming crest. The boat was built for underwater going, so little daylight penetrated the interior through the few small deadlights, or round, heavy glass windows, but electric incandescent bulbs, fed by current from the storage batteries, lit the interior brilliantly. The boat had not proceeded far when the captain ordered the crew to prepare to dive, and immediately the engine was shut down, and the clutch connecting its shaft with the electric apparatus thrown off and another connecting the electric motor with the propeller thrown in, a switch was then turned, and the current from the storage batteries set the motor and propeller spinning. While this was being done, another man was letting water into her ballast tanks to reduce her buoyancy. When all but the conning tower was submerged, the captain looked at the compass to see how she was heading, noted that no vessels were near enough to make a submarine collision likely, and gave the word to the man at his feet to dive twenty feet. Then a strange thing happened. The diving helmsman gave a twist to the wheel that connected with the horizontal rudders aft of the propeller, and immediately the boat slanted downward at an angle of ten degrees. The water rose above the conning tower, until the little windows were level with the surface, and then they were covered, and the captain looked into solid water that was still turned yellowish-green by the light of the sun. Then, swiftly descending, he saw but the faintest gleam of green light coming through twenty feet of water. The Fulton, with six men in her, was speeding along at five knots an hour, twenty feet below the shining waters of the sound. The diving helmsman kept his eye on a gauge in front of him that measured the pressure of the water at the varying depths, but the dial was so marked that it told him just how many feet the Fulton was below the surface. Another device 
showed whether the boat was on an even keel or, if not exactly, how many degrees she slanted up or down. With twenty feet of salt water above her and as much below, this mechanical whale cruised along with her human freight as comfortable as they would have been in the same space ashore. The vessel contained sufficient air to last them several hours, and when it became vitiated, there were always the tanks of compressed air ready to be drawn upon. Except for the hum of the motor and the slight crank of the steering gear, all was silent. None of the noises of the outer world penetrated the watery depths, neither the slap of the waves, the whir of the breeze, the hiss of the steam, nor rattle of rigging accompanied the progress of this submarine craft. As silently as a fish, as far as the outer world was concerned, the Fulton crept through the submarine darkness. If an enemy's ship was near, it would be an easy thing to discharge one of the five whitehead torpedoes she carried and get out of harm's way before it struck the bottom of the ship and exploded. In the tube which opened at the very tip end of the nose of the craft lay a whitehead or automobile torpedo, which when properly set and ejected by compressed air propelled itself at a predetermined depth at a speed of thirty knots an hour until it struck the object it was aimed at or its compressed air power gave out. The seven Holland boats built for the United States Navy of which the Fulton is a prototype, carry five of these torpedoes, one in the tube and two on either side of the hold, and each boat is also provided with one compensating tank for each torpedo, so that when one or all are fired, their weight may be compensated by filling the tanks with water, so that the trim of the vessel will be kept the same and her stability retained. The Fulton, however, was bent on a peaceful errand and carried dummy torpedoes instead of the deadly engines of destruction that the man-o'-war's man dreads. Dive thirty, ordered the captain, at the same time giving his wheel a twist to direct the vessel's course according to the pointing finger of the compass. Dive thirty, sir, repeated the steersman below, and with a slight twist of his gear, the horizontal rudders turned and the submarine inclined downward. The level indicator showed a slight slant, and the depth gauge hand turned slowly round, twenty-two, twenty-five, twenty-eight, then thirty feet, when the helmsman turned his wheel back a little and the vessel forged ahead on an even keel. At thirty feet below the surface, the little craft, built like a cigar on purpose, to stand a tremendous squeeze, was subjected to a pressure of 2,160 pounds to the square foot. To realize this pressure, it will be necessary to think of a slab of iron, a foot square and weighing 2,160 pounds, pressing on every foot of the outer surface of the craft. Of course, the squeeze is exerted on all sides of the submarine boats when fully submerged, just as everyone is subjected to an atmospheric pressure of 15 pounds to the square inch on every inch of his body. The Fulton and other submarine boats are so strongly built and thoroughly braced that they could stand an even greater pressure without damage. When the commander of the Fulton ordered his vessel to the surface, the diving steersman simply reversed his rudders so that they turned upward, and the propeller, aided by the natural buoyancy of the boat, simply pushed her to the surface. The Holland boats have a reserve buoyancy so that if anything should happen to the machinery, they would rise unaided to the surface. Compressed air was turned into the ballast tanks, the water forced out so that the boat's buoyancy was increased, and she floated in a semi-awash, or light condition. The engineer turned off the current from the storage batteries, threw off the motor from the propeller shaft, and connected the gasoline engine, started it up, and inside of five minutes, 
from the time the Fulton was navigating the waters of the Sound at depth of thirty feet, she was sailing along on the surface like any other gasoline craft, and so the ninety-mile journey down Long Island Sound, partly under water, partly on the surface, to New York, was completed. The greater voyage to the Delaware Capes followed, and at all times the little sixty-three-foot boat that was but eleven feet in diameter at her greatest girth carried her crew and equipment with perfect safety and without the least inconvenience. Such a vessel, small in size but great in destructive power, is a force to be reckoned with by the most powerful battleship. No defense has yet been devised that will ward off the deadly sting of the submarine's torpedo, delivered as it is from beneath, out of the sight and hearing of the doomed ship's crews, and exploded against a portion of the hull that cannot be adequately protected by armor. Though the conning dome of a submarine presents a very small target, its appearance above water shows her position and gives warning of her approach. To avoid this tell-tale, an instrument called a periscope has been invented, which looks like a bottle on the end of a tube. This has lenses and mirrors that reflect into the interior of the submarine whatever shows above water. The bottle part projects above, while the tube penetrates the interior. The very unexpectedness of the submarine's attack, the mere knowledge that they are in the vicinity of a fleet and may launch their deadly missiles at any time, is enough to break down the nerves of the strongest and eventually throw into a panic the bravest crew. That the crews of the warships will have to undergo the strain of submarine attack in the next naval war is almost sure. All the great nations of the world have built fleets of submarines or are preparing to do so. In the development of underwater fighting craft, France leads, as she has the largest fleet and was the first to encourage the designing and building of them. But it was David Bushnell that invented and built the first practical working submarine boat and in point of efficiency and practical working under service conditions in actual readiness for hostile action, the American boats excel today. A PEACEFUL SUBMARINE Under the green sea, in the total darkness of the great depths and the yellowish-green of the shallows of the oceans, with the seaweeds waving their fronds about their barnacle-encrusted timbers, and the creatures of the deep, playing in and about the decks and rotted rigging, lie hundreds of wrecks. Many a splendid ship with a valuable cargo has gone down off a dangerous coast. Many a hoard of gold or silver, gathered with infinite pains from the far corners of the earth, lies intact in decaying strong boxes on the bottom of the sea. To recover the treasures of the deep, expeditions have been organized, Ships have sailed, divers have descended, and crews have braved great dangers. Many great wrecking companies have been formed which accomplish wonders in the saving of wrecked vessels and cargoes. But in certain places all the time, and at others part of the time, wreckers have had to leave valuable wrecks a prey to the merciless sea, because the ocean is too angry and the waves too high to permit of the safe handling of an air hose and lifeline of the divers who are depended upon to do all the underwater work, rigging of hoisting tackle, placing of buoys, etc. Indeed, it is often impossible for a vessel to stay in one place long enough to accomplish anything, or, in fact, to venture to the spot at all. It was an American boy who, after reading Jules Verne's Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea, said to himself, Why not? And from that time set out to put into practice what the French writer had imagined. Simon Lake set to work to invent a way by which a wrecked vessel or a precious cargo could be got at from below the surface. 
though the waves may be tossing their white caps high in the air and the strong wind may turn the watery plain into rolling hills of angry seas the water twenty or thirty feet below hardly feels any surface motion so he set to work to build a vessel that should be able to sail on the surface or travel on the bottom and provide a shelter from which divers could go at will undisturbed by the most tempestuous sea people laughed at his idea and so he found great difficulty in getting enough capital to carry out his plan and his first boat built largely with his own hands had little in its appearance to inspire confidence in his scheme built of wood fourteen feet long and five feet deep fitted with three wheels argonaut junior looked not unlike a large go-cart such as boys make out of a soap-box and a set of wooden wheels the boat however made actual trips navigated by its inventor proving that his plan was feasible argonaut junior having served its purpose was abandoned and now lies neglected on one of the beaches of new york bay the argonaut mr lake's second vessel had the regular submarine look except that she was equipped with two great rough tread wheels forward and to the underside of her rudder was pivoted another she was really an underwater tricycle a diving bell a wrecking craft and a surface gasoline boat all rolled into one when floating on the surface she looked not unlike an ordinary sailing craft two long spars each about thirty feet above the deck forming the letter a these were the pipes that admitted fresh air and discharged the burnt gases of the gasoline motor and the vitiated air that had been breathed a low deck gave a ship-shape appearance when floating but below she was shaped like a very fat cigar under the deck and outside of the hull proper were placed her gasoline tanks safe from any possible danger of ignition from the interior from her nose protruded a spar that looked like a bowsprit but which was in reality a derrick below the derrick boom were several glazed openings that resembled eyes and a mouth these were the lookout windows for the underwater observer and the submarine searchlight the argonaut was built to run on the surface or on the bottom she was not designed to navigate halfway between when in search of a wreck or made ready for a cruise along the bottom the trap-door or hatch in her turret-like pilot house was tightly closed the water was let into her ballast tanks and two heavy weights to which were attached strong cables that could be wound or unwound from the inside were lowered from their recesses in the fore and after part of the keel of the boat to the bottom then the motor was started connected to the winding mechanism and the buoyancy of the boat being greatly reduced she was drawn to the bottom by the winding of the anchor cables as she sank more and more water was taken into her tanks until she weighed slightly more than the water she displaced when her wheels rested on the bottom, her anchor weights were pulled completely into their wells so that they would not interfere with her movements. Then the strange submarine vehicle began her voyage on the bottom of the bay or ocean. Since the pipes projected above the surface, plenty of fresh air was admitted, and it was quite as easy to run the gasoline engine under water as on the surface. In the turrets, as far removed as possible from the magnetic influences of the steel hull, the compass was placed, and an ingeniously arranged mirror reflected its readings down below, where the steersman could see it conveniently. Aft of the steering wheel was the gasoline motor, connected with the propeller shaft and also with the driving wheels. It was so arranged that either could be thrown out of gear or both operated at once she was equipped with depth gauges showing the distance below the surface and another device showing the trim of the vessel compressed air tanks propelling and pumping machinery an air compressor and dynamo 
which supplied the current to light the ship, and also for the searchlight, which illuminated the underwater pathway. All this apparatus left but little room in the hold, but it was all so carefully planned that not an inch was wasted, and space was still left for her crew of three or four to work, eat, and even sleep below the waves. Forward of the main space of the boat were the diving and lookout compartments, which really were the most important parts of the boat, as far as her wrecking ability was concerned. By means of a trap door in the diving compartment through the bottom of the boat, a man fitted with a diving suit could go out and explore a wreck or examine the bottom almost as easily as a man goes out of his front door to call for an extra. It will be thought at once, but the water will rush in when the trap door is open. This is prevented by filling the diving compartment, which is separated from the main part of the ship by steel walls, with compressed air of sufficient pressure to keep the water from coming in. That is, the pressure of water from without equals the pressure of air from within, and neither element can pass into the other's domain. An airlock separates the diver's section from the main hold so that it is possible to pass from one to the other while the entrance to the sea is still open. A person entering the lock from the large room first closes the door between them and then gradually admits the compressed air until the pressure is the same as in the diving compartment when the door into it may be safely open. When returning, this operation is simply reversed. The lookout stands forward of the diver's space. When the argonaut rolls along the bottom, round openings protected with heavy glass permit the lookout to follow the beam of light thrown by the searchlight and see dimly any sizable obstruction. When the diving compartment is in use, the man on lookout duty uses a portable telephone to tell his shipmates in the main room what is happening out in the wet and, by the same means, the reports of the diver can be communicated without opening the airlock. This little ship, 36 feet long, has done wonderful things. She has cruised over the bottom of Chesapeake Bay, New York Bay, Hampton Roads, and the Atlantic Ocean, her driving wheels propelling her when the bottom was hard, and her screw when the oozy condition of the submarine road made her spiked wheels useless except to steer with. Her passengers have been able to examine the bottom under twenty feet of water without wetting their feet through the trap door with the aid of an electric light to let down into the clear depths. Telephone messages have been sent from the bottom of Baltimore Harbor to the top of the New York World Building, telling of the conditions there in contrast to the New York editor's aerial perch. Cables have been picked up and examined without dredging, a hook lowered through the trap door being all that was necessary. Wrecks have been examined and valuables recovered. Although the Argonaut traveled over 2,000 miles underwater and on the surface, propelled by her own power, her inventor was not satisfied with her. He cut her in two, therefore, and added a section to her, making her 66 feet long. This allowed more comfortable quarters for her crew, space for larger engines, compressors, etc. It was off Bridgeport, Connecticut, that the new Argonaut did her first practical wrecking. A barge loaded with coal had sunk in a gale and could not be located with the ordinary means. The Argonaut, however, with the aid of a device called the wreck detector, also invented by Mr. Lake, speedily found it, sank near it, and also submerged a new kind of freight boat built for the purpose by the inventor. A diver quickly explored the hulk, opened the hatches of the freight boat, which was cigar-shaped like the Argonaut, and supplied with wheels so it could be drawn over the bottom, and placed the suction tube in position. Seven minutes later, 
eight tons of coal had been transferred from the wreck to the submarine freight boat. The hatches were then closed and compressed air admitted, forcing out the water, and five minutes later the freight boat was floating on the surface with eight tons of coal from a wreck that could not even be located by the ordinary means. It is possible that in the future these modern argonauts will be seeking the golden fleeces of the sea in wrecks, in golden sands like the beaches of Nome, and that these amphibious boats will be ready along all the dangerous coasts to rush to the rescue of noble ships and wrest them from the clutches of the cruel sea. Mr. Lake has also designed and built a submarine torpedo boat that will travel on the surface, under the waves, or on the bottom, provided with both gasoline and electric power, and fitted with torpedo discharge tubes, she will be able to throw a submarine torpedo. Her diver could attach a charge of dynamite to the keel of an anchored warship, or she could do great damage by hooking up cables through her diver's trap door and cutting them, and by setting adrift anchored torpedoes and submarine mines. Thus have Jules Verne's imaginings come true, and the dream Nautilus, whose adventures so many of us have breathlessly followed, has been succeeded by actual Hollands and practical Argonauts designed by American inventors and manned by American crews. End of chapter 9ten of stories of inventors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by adam marsitich alexandria virginia july 2010 stories of inventors the adventures of inventors and engineers by russell doubleday chapter 10 Long Distance Telephony What Happens When You Talk Into a Telephone Receiver In Omaha, Nebraska, halfway across the continent, and about 40 hours from Boston by fast train, a man sits comfortably in his office chair, and, with no more exertion than is required to lift a portable receiver off his desk, talks every day to his representative in the chief New England city, the man in Boston hears his chief's voice and can recognize the peculiarities in it just as if he stood in the same room with him. The man in Nebraska, speaking in an ordinary conversational tone, can be heard perfectly well in Boston, 1,400 miles away. This is the longest talk on record. That is, it is the longest continuous telephone line in steady and constant use, though the human voice has been carried even greater distances with the aid of this wonderful instrument. The telephone is so common that no one stops to consider the wonder of it, and not one person in a hundred can tell how it works. At this time, when the telephone is as necessary as pen and ink, it is hard to realize a time when men could not speak to one another from a distance, yet a little more than a quarter of a century ago, the genius who invented it first conceived the great idea. Sometimes an inventor is a prophet. He sees in advance how his idea, perfected and in universal use, will change things, establish new manners and customs, new laws and new methods. Alexander Graham Bell, was one of these prophetic inventors. The telephone was his invention, not his discovery. He first got the idea, and then sought a way to make it practical. If you put yourself in his place, forget what has been accomplished, and put out of mind how the voice is transmitted from place to place by the slender wire, it would be impossible even then to realize how much in the dark Professor Bell was in 1874. The human speaking voice is full of changes, 
unlike the notes from a musical instrument, there is no uniformity in it. The rise and fall of inflection, the varying sound of the vowels and consonants, the combinations of words and syllables, each produces a different vibration and different tone. To devise an instrument that would receive all these varying tones and inflections and change them into some other form of energy so that they could be passed over a wire and then change them back to their original form, reproducing each sound and every peculiarity of the voice of the speaker and in the ear of the hearer was the task that Professor Bell set for himself. Just as you would sit down to add up a big column of figures, knowing that sooner or later you would get the correct answer, so he set himself to work out this problem in invention. The result of his study and determination is the telephones we use today. Many improvements have been invented by other men, Berliner, Edison, Blake, and others, but the idea and the working out of the principle is due to Professor Bell. Every telephone receiver and transmitter has a mouth and ear piece to receive or throw out the sound, a thin round sheet of lacquered metal, called the diaphragm, and an electromagnet. Together they reproduce human speech. An electric current from a battery or from the central station flows continuously through the wires wound round the electromagnet in receiving and transmitting instruments, so when you speak into the black mouthpiece of the wall or desk receiver, the vibrations strike against the thin sheet iron diaphragm at the small end of the mouthpiece. The sound waves of the voice make it vibrate to a greater or less degree. The diaphragm is placed so that the core of the electromagnet is close to it, and as it vibrates, the iron in it produces undulations, by induction, in the current which is flowing through the wires wound round the soft iron center of the magnet. The wires of the coil are connected with the lines that go to the receiving telephone, so that this undulating current, coiling round the core of the magnet in the receiver, attracts and repels the iron of the diaphragm in it, and it vibrates just as the transmitter diaphragm did when spoken into. The undulating current is translated by it into words and sentences that have all the peculiarities of the original. And so when speaking into a telephone, your voice is converted into undulations or waves in an electric current conveyed with incredible swiftness to the receiving instrument, and these are translated back into the vibrations that produce speech. This is really what takes place when you talk over a toy telephone made by a string stretched between the two tin mouthpieces held at opposite sides of the room, with the difference that in the telephone the vibrations are carried electrically, while the toy carries them mechanically and not nearly so perfectly. For once the world realized immediately the importance of a revolutionizing invention, and telephone stations soon began to be established in the large cities. Quicker than the telegraph, for there was no need of an operator to translate the message, and more accurate, for if spoken clearly, the words could be as clearly understood. The telephone service spread rapidly. Lines stretched farther and farther out from the central stations in the cities as improvements were invented, until the outlying wires of one town reached the outstretched lines of another, and then communication between town and town was established. Then two distant cities talked to each other through an intermediate town, and long-distance telephony was established. Today, special lines are built to carry long-distance messages from one great city to another, and these direct lines are used entirely except when storms break through or the rush of business makes the roundabout route through intermediate cities necessary. As the nerves reaching from your fingertips, from your ears, your eyes, 
and every portion of your body come to a focus in your brain and carry information to it about the things you taste, see, hear, feel, and smell. So the wires of a telephone system come together at the central station, and as it is necessary for your right hand to communicate with your left through your brain, so it is necessary for one telephone subscriber to connect through the central station with another subscriber. The telephone has become a necessity of modern life, so that if through some means all the systems were destroyed, business would be, for a time at least, paralyzed. It is the perfection of the devices for connecting one subscriber with another and for dispatching the vast number of messages and calls at central that make modern telephony possible. To handle the great number of spoken messages that are sent over the telephone wires of a great city, it is necessary to divide the territory into districts, which vary in size according to the number of subscribers in them. Where the telephones are thickly installed, the districts are smaller than in sections that are more sparsely settled. Then all the telephone wires of a certain district converge at a central station, and each pair of wires is connected with its own particular switch at the switchboard of the station. That is simple enough, but when you come to consider that every subscriber must be so connected that he can be put into communication with every other subscriber, not only in his own section, but also with every subscriber throughout the city, it will be seen that the switchboard at Central is as marvelous as it is complicated. Some of the busy stations in New York have to take care of 6,000 or more customers and 10,000 telephone instruments, while the city proper is crisscrossed with more than 60,000 lines bearing messages from more than 100,000 phones. Just think of the babble entering the branch centrals that has to be straightened out and each separate series of voice undulations sent on its proper way to be translated into speech again and poured into the proper ear. It is no wonder then that it has been found necessary to establish a school for telephone girls where they can be taught how to untangle the snarl and handle the vast, complicated system. In these schools, the operators go through a regular course lasting a month. They listen to lectures and work out the instructions given them at a practice switchboard that is exactly like the service switchboard, except that the wires do not go outside of the building, but connect with the instructor's desk. The instructor calls up the pupils and sends messages in just the same way that the subscribers call central in the regular service. At the terminal station of a great railroad, in the midst of a network of shining rails, stands the switchman's tower. By means of steel levers, the man in his tower can throw his different switches and open one track to a train and close another. By means of various signals, the switchman can tell if any given line is clear or if his levers do their work properly. A telephone system may be likened, in a measure, to a complicated railroad line. The trunk wires to subscribers are like the tracks of the railroad, and the central station may be compared to the switch tower, while the central operators are like the switchman. It is the central girl's business to see that connections are made quickly and correctly, that no lines are tied up unnecessarily, that messages are properly charged to the right persons, that in case of a break in a line, the messages are switched round the trouble, and above all, that there shall be no delay. When you take the receiver off the hook, a tiny electric bulb glows opposite the brass-lined hole that is marked with your number on the switchboard of your central, and the telephone girl knows that you are ready to send in a call. The flash of the little light is a signal to her 
that you want to be connected with some other subscriber, whereupon she inserts in your connection a brass plug to which a flexible wire is attached and then opens a little lever which connects her with your circuit. Then she speaks into a kind of inverted horn which projects from a transmitter that hangs round her neck and asks, Number, please? You answer with the number, which she hears through the receiver strapped to her head and ear. After repeating the number, the hello girl proceeds to make the connection. If the number required is in the same section of the city, she simply reaches for the hole or connection which corresponds with it, with another brass plug, the twin of the one that is already inserted in your connection, and touches the brass lining with the plug. All the connections to each central station are so arranged and duplicated that they are within the reach of each operator. If the line is already busy, a slight buzz is heard, not only by central, but by the subscriber also if he listens. Central notifies and then disconnects you. If the line is clear, the twin plug is thrust into the opening, and at the same time central presses a button, which either rings a bell or causes a drop to fall in the private exchange station of the party you wish to talk to. The moment the new connection is made, and the party you wish to talk to takes the receiver from his hook, a second light glows beside yours, and continues to glow as long as the receiver remains off. The two little lamps are a signal to central that the connection is properly made, and she can then attend to some other call. When your conversation is finished, and your receivers are hung up, the little lights go out. That signals central again, and she withdraws the plug from both holes and pushes another button, which connects with a meter made like a bicycle cyclometer. This little instrument records your call, a meter is provided for each subscriber, and at the same time lights the two tiny lamps again. A signal to the inspector, if one happens to be watching, that the call is properly recorded. All this takes long to read, but it is done in the twinkling of an eye. Central's hands are both free, and by long practice and close attention, she is able to make and break connections with marvelous rapidity, it being quite an ordinary thing for an operator in a busy section to make ten connections a minute, while in an emergency this rate is greatly increased. The call of one subscriber for another number in the same section as described above, for instance, the call of 4341 18th Street for 2165 18th Street is the easiest connection that Central has to make. As it is impossible for each branch exchange to be connected with every individual line in a great city, when a subscriber of one exchange wishes to talk with a subscriber of another, two central operators are required to make the connection. If number 4341 18th Street wants to talk to 1748 Cortland Street, for instance, the 18th Street Central, who gets the 4341 call, makes a connection with the operator at Cortland Street and asks for number 1748. The Cortland Street operator goes through the operation of testing to see if 1748 is busy, and if not, she assigns a wire connecting the two exchanges, whereupon in 18th Street, one plug is put in 4341 switch hole. The twin plug is put into the switch hole connecting with the wire to Cortland Street. At Cortland Street, the same thing is done with number 1748 pair of plugs. The lights glow in both exchanges, notifying the operators when the conversation is begun and ended, and the operator of 18th Street Central makes the record in the same way as she does when both numbers are in her own district. 
Besides the calls for numbers within the cities, there are the out-of-town calls. In this case, Central simply makes a connection with Long Distance, which is a separate company, though allied with the city companies. Long Distance makes the connection in much the same way as the branch city exchanges. As the charges for long-distance calls depend on the length of the conversation, so the connection is made by an operator whose business it is to make a record of the length and minutes of the conversation and the place with which the city subscriber is connected. An automatic time stamp accomplishes this without possibility of error. Sometimes, the calls come from a pay station, in which case a record must be kept of the time occupied. This kind of call is indicated by the glow of a red light instead of a white one, and so Central is warned to keep track, and the supervisors or monitors who constantly pass to and fro can note the kind of calls that come in, and so keep tab on the operators. Other colored lights indicate that the chief operator wishes to send out a general order and wishes all operators to listen. Another indicates that there is trouble somewhere on the line which needs the attention of the wire chief and repair department. The switchboards themselves are made of hard black rubber and honeycombed with innumerable holes, each of which is connected with a subscriber. Below the switchboard is a broad shelf in which are set the miniature lamps and from which project the brass plugs in rows. The flexible cords containing the connecting wires are weighted and hang below so that when a plug is pulled out of a socket and dropped, it slides back automatically to its proper place, ready for use. Many subscribers nowadays have their own private exchanges and several lines running to Central. Perhaps number 4341 18th Street has 4342 and 4344 as well. This is indicated on the switchboard by a line of red or white drawn under the three switch holes so that Central, finding one line busy, may be able to make connection with one of the other two the line underneath showing at a glance which numbers belong to that particular subscriber. If a subscriber is away temporarily, a plug of one color is inserted in his socket, or if he is behind in his payments to the company, a plug of another color is put in, and if the service to his house is discontinued, still another plug notifies the operator of the fact and it remains there until that number is assigned to a new subscriber. The operators sit before the switchboard in high swivel chairs in a long row, with their backs to the center of the room. From the rear, it looks as if they were weaving some intricate fabric that unravels as fast as it is woven. Their hands move almost faster than the eye can follow, and the patterns made by the crisscrossed cords of the connecting plugs are constantly changing, varying from minute to minute as the colors in a kaleidoscope form new designs with every turn of the handle. Into the exchange pour all the throbbing messages of a great city, business propositions, political deals, scientific talks, and words of comfort to the troubled cross and recross each other over the black switchboard. The wonder is that each message reaches the ear it was meant for, and that all complications, no matter how knotty, are immediately unraveled. In the cities, the telephone is a necessity. Business engagements are made and contracts consummated. Brokers keep in touch with their associates on the floors of the exchanges. The patrolmen of the police force keep their chief informed of their movements and the state of the districts under their care. Alarms of fire are telephoned to the fire engine houses, and calls for ambulances bring the swift wagons on their errands of mercy. Even wreckers telephone to their divers on the bottom of the bay, 
and undulating electrical messages travel to the tops of towering skyscrapers. In Europe, it is possible to hear the latest opera by paying a small fee and putting a receiver to your ear, and so also may lazy people and invalids hear the latest news without getting out of bed. The farmers of the West, and in eastern states too, have learned to use the barbed wire that fences off their fields as a means of communicating with one another and with distant parts of their own property. Mr. Pupin has invented an apparatus by which he hopes to greatly extend the distance over which men may talk, and it has even been suggested that Uncle Sam and John Bull may in the future swap stories over a transatlantic telephone line. The marvels accomplished suggest the possible marvels to come. Automatic exchanges, whereby the central telephone operator is done away with, is one of the things that inventors are now at work on. The one thing that prevents an unlimited use of the telephone is the expensive wires and the still more expensive work of putting them underground or stringing them overhead. So the capping of the climax of the wonders of the telephone would be wireless telephony, each instrument being so attuned that the undulations would respond only to the corresponding instrument. This is one of the problems that inventors are even now working upon, and it may be that wireless telephones will be in actual operation not many years after this appears in print. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Stories of Inventors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marcetich, Alexandria, Virginia, July 2010. Stories of Inventors. The Adventures of Inventors and Engineers by Russell Doubleday. Chapter 11. A machine that thinks, a typesetting machine that makes mathematical calculations. For many years it was thought impossible to find a shortcut from author's manuscript to printing press, that is, to substitute a machine for the skilled hands that set the type from which a book or magazine is printed. Inventors have worked at this problem, and a number have solved it in various ways. To one who has seen the slow work of hand typesetting as the compositor builds up a long column of metal piece by piece, letter by letter, picking up each character from its allotted space in the case and placing it in its proper order and position, and then realizes that much of the printed matter he sees is so produced, the wonder is how the enormous amount of it is ever accomplished. In a page of this size, there are more than a thousand separate pieces of type, which, if set by hand, would have to be taken one by one and placed in the compositor's stick, then when the line is nearly set, it would have to be spaced out, or justified, to fill out the line exactly. When the compositor's stick is full, or two and a half inches have been set, the type has to be taken out, and placed in a long channel, or galley. Each of these three operations requires considerable time and close application, and with each change there is the possibility of error. It is a long, expensive process. A perfect typesetting machine should take the place of the hand compositor, setting the type letter by letter automatically in proper order at maximum speed, and with a minimum chance of error. These three steps of hand composition, slow, expensive, open to many chances of mistake, have been covered at one stride, at five times the speed, at one-third the cost, and much more accurately by a machine invented by Mr. Tolbert Lanston. The operator of the Lanston machine sits at a keyboard, much like a typewriter in appearance, 
containing every character in common use, 225 in all, and at a speed limited only by his dexterity, he plays on the keys exactly as a typewriter works his machine. This is the sum total of human effort expended. The machine does all the rest of the work, makes the calculations, and delivers the product in clean, shining new type, each piece perfect, each in its place, each line of exactly the right length, and each space between the words mathematically equal, absolutely justified. It is practically hand composition, with the human possibility of error, of wariness, of inattention, of ignorance, eliminated, and all accomplished with a celerity that is astonishing. This machine is a type-casting machine, as well as a type-setter. It casts the type, individual characters, it sets, perfect in face and body, capable of being used in hand composition, or put to press directly from the machine and printed form. As each piece of type is separate, alterations are easily made. The type for correction, which the machine itself casts for the purpose, a lot of A's, B's, etc., is simply substituted for the words misspelled or incorrectly used, as in hand composition. The Lanston machine is composed of two parts, the keyboard and the casting setting machine. The keyboard part may be placed wherever convenient, away from noise or anything that is likely to distract or interrupt the operator, and the perforated roll of paper produced by it, which governs the setting machine, may be taken away as fast as it is finished. In the setting casting machine is located the brains. The five-inch roll of paper, perforated by the keyboard machine, a hole for every letter, gives the signal by means of compressed air to the mechanism that puts the matrix, or type mold, in position, and casts the type letter by letter, each character following the proper sequence as marked by the perforations of the paper ribbon. By means of an indicator scale on the keyboard, the operator can tell how many spaces there are between the words of the line and the remaining space to be filled out to make the line the proper width. This information is marked by perforations on the paper ribbon by the pressure of two keys, and when the ribbon is transferred to the casting machine, these space perforations so govern the casting that the line of type delivered at the galley complete shall be of exactly the proper length, and the spaces between the words be equal to the infinitesimal fraction of an inch. The casting machine is an ingenious mechanism of many complicated parts. In a word, the melted metal, a composition of zinc and lead, is forced into a mold of the letter to be cast. Two hundred and twenty-five of these molds are collected in a steel frame about three inches square, and cool water is kept circulating about them, so that almost immediately after the molten metal is injected into the lines and dots of the letter cut in the mold, it hardens and drops into its slot a perfect piece of type. All this is accomplished at a rate of four or five thousand m's per hour of the size of type used on this page. The letter m is the unit of measurement when the amount of any piece of composition is to be estimated and is written em. If this page were set by hand, taking a compositor of more than average speed as a basis for figuring, at least one hour of steady work would be required, but this page set by the Lanston machine, the operator being of the same grade as the hand compositor, would hardly require more than fifteen minutes from the time the manuscript was put into the operator's hands to the delivery complete of the newly cast type in galleys ready to be made up into pages, if the process were carried on continuously. This marvelous machine is capable of setting almost any size of type, 
from the minute agate to and including pica a letter more than one-eighth of an inch high and a line of almost any desired width the change from one size to any other requiring but a few minutes the lanston machine sets up tables of figures poetry and all those difficult pieces of composition that so try the patience of the hand compositor it is called the monotype because it casts and sets up the type piece by piece another machine invented by mergenthaler practically sets up the molds by a sort of typewriter arrangement for a line at a time and then a casting is taken of a whole line at once this machine is used much in newspaper offices where the cleverness of the compositor has to be depended upon and there is little or no time for corrections several other machines set the regular type that is made in type foundries the type being placed in long channels all of the same sort in the same grooves and slipped or set in its proper place by the machine operated by a man at the keyboard these machines require a separate mechanism that distributes each type in its proper place after use or else a separate compositor must be employed to do this by hand the machines that set foundry type moreover require a great stock of it just as many hundred pounds of expensive type are needed for hand composition though a machine has been invented that will put an author's words into type no mechanism has yet been invented that will do away with type altogether it is one of the problems still to be solved end of chapter eleven of stories of inventors this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by adam marsitich alexandria virginia july 2010 stories of inventors the adventures of inventors and engineers by russell doubleday chapter 12 how heat produces cold artificial ice making one midsummer's day a fleet of united states warships were lying at anchor in guantanamo bay on the southern coast of cuba the sky was cloudless and the tropic sun shone so fiercely on the decks that the barefooted jackies had to cross the unshaded spots on the jump to save their feet an hour before the quavering mess call sounded for the midday meal when the sun was shining almost perpendicularly a boat's crew from one of the cruisers were sent over to the supply ship for a load of beef not a breath was stirring the smooth surface of the bay reflected the brazen sun like a mirror and it seemed to the oarsmen that the salt water would scald them if they should touch it only a few hundred yards separated the two vessels, yet the heat seemed almost beyond endurance, and the shade cast by the tall steel sides of the supply steamer when the boat reached it was as comforting as a cool drink to a thirsty man. The oars were shipped, and one man was left to fend off the boat, while the others clambered up the swaying rope ladder, crossed the scorching decks on the run, and went below in two minutes they were in the hold of the refrigerator ship gathering the frost from the frigid cooling pipes and snowballing each other while the boat keeper outside of the three eighth inch steel plating was fanning himself with his hat almost dizzy from the quavering heat waves that danced before his eyes the great sides of beef hung in rows were frozen as hard as rock even after the strip of water had been crossed on the return journey and the meat exposed to the full unobstructed glare of the sun the cruisers mess cooks had to saw off their portions and the remainder continued hard as long as it lasted 
but the satisfaction of the men who ate that fresh American beef cannot be told. Cream from a famous dairy is sent to particular patrons in Paris, France, and it is known that in one instance, at least, a bottle of cream, having failed to reach the person to whom it was consigned, made the return transatlantic voyage, and was received in New York three weeks after its first departure, perfectly sweet and good. Throughout the entire journey, it was kept at freezing temperature by artificial means. These are but two striking examples of wonders that are performed every day. Cold, of course, is but the absence of heat, and so refrigerating machinery is designed to extract the heat from whatever substance it is desired to cool. The refrigerating agent used to extract the heat from the cold chamber must in turn have the heat extracted from it, and so the process must be continuous. Water, when it boils and turns into steam or vapor, is heated by or extracts heat from the fire. But water vaporizes at a high temperature, and so cannot be used to produce cold. Other fluids are much more volatile and evaporate much more easily. Alcohol, when split on the hand, dries almost instantly and leaves a feeling of cold. The warmth of the hand boils the alcohol and turns it into vapor, and in doing so extracts the heat from the skin, making it cold. Now, if the evaporated alcohol could be caught and compressed into its liquid form again, you would have a refrigerating machine. Alcohol is expensive and inflammable, and many other volatile substances have been discarded for the one or the other reason. Of all the fluids that have been tried, ammonia has been found to work most satisfactorily. It evaporates at a low temperature, is non-inflammable, and is comparatively cheap. The hold of the supply ship mentioned at the head of this chapter was a vast refrigerator, but no ice was used except that produced mechanically by the power in the ship. To produce the cold in the hold of the ship, it was necessary to extract the heat in it. To accomplish this, coils ran round the space filled with cold brine, which, as it grew warm, drew the heat from the air. The brine, in turn, circulated through a tank containing pipes filled with ammonia vapor, which extracted the heat from it. The brine then was ready to circulate through the coils in the hold again and extract more heat. The heat extracting or cooling power of the ammonia is exerted continually by the process described below. Ammonia requires heat to expand and turn into vapor, and this heat it extracts from the substance surrounding it. In this marine refrigerating machine, the ammonia got the heat from the brine in the tank, then it was drawn by a pump from the pipes in the tank, compressed by a power compressor, and forced into a second coil. The second coil is called a condenser, because the vapor was there condensed into a fluid again. Over the pipes of the condenser, cool water dripped constantly and carried off the heat in the ammonia vapor inside the coils and so condensed it into a fluid again, just as cold condenses steam into water. The compressor pump then forced the fluid, ammonia through a small pipe from the condenser coils to the cooling coils in the tank of brine. The pipes of the cooling coils are much larger than those of the condenser, and as the fluid ammonia is forced in a fine spray into these large pipes and the pressure is relieved, it expands or boils into the larger volume of vapor and in so doing extracts heat from the brine. The pump draws the heated vapor out, the compressor makes it dense, and the coils over which the cool water flows condenses it into fluid again, and so the circuit continues. Through cooler, pump, compressor, and condenser, back into the cooling tank. In the meantime, 
the cold brine is being pumped through pipes in the hold of the ship, where it extracts the heat from the air and the rows of sides of beef, and then returns to the cooling tank. In the refrigerating plant, then, of the supply ship, there were two heat extracting circuits, one of ammonia and the other of brine. Brine is used because it freezes at a very low temperature and continues to flow when unsalted water would be frozen solid. The ammonia is not used direct in the pipes in a big space like the hold of a ship because so much of it would be required. And then there is always danger of the exposed pipes being broken and the dangerous fumes released. Opposite as it may seem, heat is required to produce cold, for steam is necessary to drive the compressor and pump of a refrigerating plant, and fire of some sort is necessary to make steam. The first artificial refrigerating machines produced cold by compressing and expanding air, the compressed air containing the heat being cooled by jets of cool water spurted into the cylinder containing it, then the compressed air was released or expanded into a larger chamber and thereby extracted the heat from brine or whatever substance surrounded it. It is in the making of ice, however, that refrigerating machinery accomplishes its most surprising results. It was said in the writer's hearing recently that natural ice costs about as much when it was delivered at the docks or freight yards of the large cities of the north as the product of the ice machine. Of course, the manufactured ice is produced near the spot where it is consumed, and there is little loss through melting while it is being stored or transported, as in the case of the natural product. There are two ways of making ice, or rather, two methods using the same principle. In the can system, a series of galvanized iron cans about three and a half feet deep, eight inches wide, by two and a half feet long, are suspended or rested in great tanks of brine, connecting with the cooling tank through which the pipes containing the ammonia vapor circulates. The vapor draws the heat from the brine, and the brine, which is kept moving constantly, in turn extracts the heat from the distilled water in the cans. While this method produces ice quickly, it is difficult to get ice of perfect clearness and purity, because the water in the can freezes on the sides, gradually getting thicker, retaining and concentrating in the center any impurities that may be in the water. The finished cake, therefore, almost always has a white or cloudy appearance in the center and is frequently discolored. In an ice plant operated on the can system, a great many blocks are freezing at once. In fact, the whole floor of a great room is honeycombed with trapdoors, a door for each can. The freezing is done in rotation, so that one group of cans is being emptied of their blocks of ice while others are still in process of congealing, while still others are being filled with fresh water. When the freezing is complete, jets of steam or quick immersion of the can in hot water releases the cake, and the can is ready for another charge. The plate system of artificial ice making does away with the discoloration and the cloudiness, because the water containing the impurities or the air bubbles is not frozen, but is drawn off and discarded. In the plate system, great permanent tanks six feet deep and eight to twelve feet wide of varying lengths are used. These tanks contain the clean, fresh water that is to be frozen into great slabs of ice. Into the tanks are sunk flat coils of pipe covered with smooth metal plates on either side, and it is through these pipes that the ammonia vapor flows. The plates with the coils of pipe between them fit the tank transversely, partitioning it off into narrow cells six feet deep, about 22 inches wide, and eight or ten feet long. In operation, 
the ammonia vapor flows through the pipes, chilling the plates and freezing the water, so that a gradually thickening film of ice adheres to each side of each set of plates. As the ice gets thicker, the unfrozen water between the slabs containing the impurities and air bubbles gets narrower. When the ice on the plates is 8 or 10 inches thick, very little of the unfrozen water remains between the great cakes, but it contains practically all the impurities. When the ice on the plates is thick enough, the ammonia vapor is turned off and steam forced through the pipes so that the cakes come off readily, or else plates, cakes, and all are hoisted out of the tank and the ice melted off. The ice, clear and perfect, is then sawed into convenient sizes and shipped to customers or stored for future use. Sometimes the plates or partitions are permanent, and, with the coils of pipes between them, cold brine is circulated, but in either case the two surfaces of ice do not come together, there being always a film of water between. Still another method produces ice by forcing the clean water in extremely fine spray into a reservoir from which the air has been exhausted, into a vacuum, in other words. The spray condenses in the form of tiny particles of ice, which are attached to the walls of the reservoir. The ice grows thicker as a carpet of snow increases, one particle falling on and freezing to the others, until the coating has reached the required thickness, when it is loosened and cut up in cakes of convenient size. The vacuum ice is of marble-like whiteness and appearance, but is perfectly pure, and it is said to be quite as hard. More and more artificial ice is being used, even in localities where ice is formed naturally during parts of the year. Many of the modern hotels are equipped with refrigerating plants because they make their own ice, cool their own storage rooms, freeze the water in glass carafes for the use of their guests, and even cool the air that is circulated through the ventilating system in hot weather. In many large apartment houses, the refrigerators built in the various separate suites are kept at freezing temperature by pipes leading to a refrigerating plant in the cellar. The convenience and neatness of this plan over the method of carrying dripping cakes from floor to floor in a dumbwaiter is evident. Another use of refrigerating plants that is greatly appreciated is the making of artificial ice for skating rinks. An artificial ice skating rink is simply an ice machine on a grand scale the ice being made in a great thin flat cake. Through the shallow tanks containing the fresh water, coils of pipe through which flows the ammonia vapor or the cold brine are run from end to end or from side to side so that the whole bottom of the tank is gridironed with pipes, the water covering the pipes is speedily frozen and a smooth surface formed. When the skaters cut up the surface, it is flooded and frozen over again. So efficient and common have refrigerating plants become that artificially cooled water is on tap in many public places in the great cities. Theaters are cooled during hot weather by a portion of the same machinery that supplies the heat in winter, and it is not improbable that every large establishment, private or public, will in the near future have its own refrigerating plant. Inventors are now at work on cold air stoves that draw in warm air, extract the heat from it, and deliver it purified and cooled by many degrees. Even the people of this generation, therefore, may expect to see their furnaces turned into cooling machines in summer. Then the ice man will cease from troubling and the ice cart be at rest. End of chapter 12 End of Stories of Inventors by Russell Doubleday